Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So here we are at the end of the church year. We've got, this is the second to last Sunday of the church year. And so what I want to do for these last two weeks before we get into Advent and, and Christmas and we're going to be starting a new sermon series, I'm plugging this, not full of shame at all, a new sermon series through the book of Matthew that we'll be spending some time in next year, a sermon series called Follow Me. So I'm excited for that to start the Sunday after Thanksgiving. But today, some year-end housekeeping things, and, and I want to take a little bit of time as we're gathered here, primarily local members of, the, of our congregation, although there's a few of you who get to listen in into some of our housekeeping business, if you will, as a family. And I'd like to talk about, well, kind of about stewardship, right? And finances and the generosity, these sorts of things. And I, and I think that the perfect text for this, at least where I'm going today, the perfect text for this was, is from Acts chapter 4, what we heard read earlier today. And in that text we see a picture of the early church. Luke uh, describes what life together in the early church looked like. And this is actually the second time already in uh, you know, only chapter 4 of the book of Acts that Luke has, has given us this aside. Back in the, at the end of Luke, or I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2, he showed us the same thing. And again, he's showing us what the early church looked like. And I think this is, this is important for us because I don't know about you, but I want our church to look like that church. I want our church, by the grace and power of God, by the abundant provision of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the power of the resurrection, through the power of the Holy Spirit that we've been given in baptism, to, I want us and our church to, to look like that. And so let's, let's go there. And of course, we, we spent some time doing a whole series through the book of Acts and looking at some of the miraculous and, and powerful things. I don't know if there's anything more powerful maybe I'd even say this, more countercultural than what we read in Acts chapter 4. The church has gathered, the church has been growing. I think at this point, the church is up to some 5,000 members or so. We are close to that first Pentecost, not the first Pentecost, but close to that. The church is still primarily gathering in Jerusalem. And as the church is gathering together, sin happens. Brokenness happens. Fallenness happens. That's the reality of this broken world that we live in. And the early church was no exception. They were not uh, exempt from that reality. Peter and John, two of the twelve apostles, had just stood before the Sanhedrin, right, before the religious leaders because they, they healed a lame man. And people saw it and were like, we want more of that. We're like, we're going to listen to these guys because we know this guy, this lame, formerly lame man. He was outside of the temple for years and years. We know he couldn't walk. And then now he's jumping around and telling people, about Jesus. I want to hear more about this. And so they're pulled, dragged in front of the religious leaders, Peter and John were, and they're uh, told by the religious leaders, stop. Stop talking about Jesus. And Peter curtly replies, uh, you know, if it's between God and you, <laughs> I'm going to go with God. I'm going to listen to him on this one. So no, I'm not going to stop talking. And the church prays. And, they, and Peter and John come back to the church at that, at that moment, and they celebrate their life together. But as these people of the church are gathered together, there's not just persecution for the 
preaching of Christ that's evident or that's happening, but there's also just the realities of living in a fallen, broken world. There were people who had needs. Now, exactly what those needs were, we don't know. Uh, but we can make some guesses. Maybe there were some people that came into Jerusalem, came to town from elsewhere in the world, heard the message of Jesus Christ, and said, um, I don't want to go back yet. However, here's the problem. They only brought enough food and money for a week. And now it's been months, and they're still trying to, to get by, but they want to stay with the people of God. They want to keep hearing from the apostles. They want to hear Peter preach and John preach and, and, and to tell them about Christ. And so maybe there are people in need just because there were foreigners in this place. They, they didn't have a home. Maybe there, there were some people who were part of the early church community that just through the natural uh, playing out of life became orphans or, or widows and that they didn't, they didn't have the financial provisions necessary. Maybe there were members of the early church who had gotten themselves into some bad situations because they had a, a gambling problem and they spent too much money, lost it playing cards, and they're out of luck and they have needs. We don't know exactly why people had needs, but the needs were obvious. The needs were there. Luke tells us that. And so what does the church say? Well, too bad for you. <laughs> Guess you got to leave and go home. Sorry. No, not at all. Luke tells us that the early church had everything in common with each other. People still had their own possessions, but they didn't count them as their own. They were, they were stewards of these possessions. They recognized that what God has given me isn't actually mine. It's just a gift that God has given me, and just like he has graciously given to me, I get to graciously give to other people. So much so, Luke says that nothing was their own, that no one in the early church had any needs. He goes as far as to say this, that the early church, men and women, young and old, were of one heart and one soul. That's powerful. You see why I think this text speaks into our world in, in a, in a countercultural way, in a world that's so divided, that's so angry, that's so selfish, that's so individually oriented. This idea of, of, a, of a community that shares their stuff, not out of compulsion, but because... God has given them so much. Oh, that's powerful. That's different. There's one person that we hear, hear about that tells us about. His name is Barnabas. Barnabas had some property. A landlord, if you will. He sells that land, takes the money, lays it at the feet of Peter and Andrew and James and John and Thomas and Philip, the apostles, says, here, do with it as needed. So much so that Barnabas earns that, or isn't even his real name, right? He, his real name is Joseph. He earns the nickname Barnabas, which means son, son of encouragement. <laughs> is it encouraging when someone says, I will give you 
out of my own need or out of my own uh, uh, wealth. I'll just give to you generously. I think that's an encouragement. And we also know Barnabas goes on and he encourages the apostle Paul on his mission work in his mission journeys. I, I was thinking about this. I, I think, I mean, I, I, I think I'll say the same thing about a different person next week, but I think Barnabas is like one of my favorite uh, characters in the, uh, or people, I should say, in the New Testament, right? Uh, yeah, and there's so many, so many good ones, but Barnabas, like he's an encourager. He's, if it weren't for Barnabas, there probably wouldn't be an Apostle Paul. Like Barnabas was the guy that down the road, he goes to Tarsus when Paul was hiding, or when Paul went home, he pulls him out, says, hey, we got some work to do. Will you come with me? I think you're the right man for the job. And then, you know, Paul did a few things. Missionary journeys, 13 books in the New Testament, all that sort of stuff, right? No Barnabas, no Paul, no Paul, um, no Luke. So no Barnabas, no half your New Testament. Boy, was that powerful? I think he, I think so. The church is called to live generously towards one another. And we get to see a picture of that here in Acts 4. I think in, our, in other places in Scripture, we can see the same concepts, the same idea coming forward. Here in Galatians 6.10, Paul writes this, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's take care of each other. We heard earlier our Lord Jesus say this, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, this verse makes me, made me think, like, what do we sometimes fill in this blank, the blank with, instead of love for one another? All right? Um, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have a fantastic worship team. Powerful, right? Or, or if your preference is organ music, that you have a, a, a I don't know, billion pipe organ, right? That's uh, millions of dollars and an organist that can play it and it just blows the lid off the plate. Whatever your preference is, right? Do we ever think that, oh, that's the way that our church, that's the way we can let about us. Or wh what about uh, if we just find that right pastor, the pastor who's charismatic, the pastor who, who preaches with a, a charisma that draws people in. That's how we'll get a name for ourselves. That's how we'll put Christ Lutheran Church in Breckenridge on the map. That's what we ought to do. Or what if it was, I don't know, maybe fill in the blank with the amount of good works we do in the community. The amount of community organizations that we support financially, the amount of food drives that we participate in. Now, are any of those things that I named bad? No. Worship musicians. Someone that's going to lead us in, in singing to Jesus, to our Father, to the Holy Spirit. Is that good? Yeah, that's great. Pastors, we pray regularly. For pastors, I hope you all think that pastors are important, right? The New Testament says that, that pastors are important and, and that preaching the Word of God is important. No, no question that is super important. Our good works in our community, prayers for our community, serving those in need in our community, are those important? Absolutely. And yet... What Jesus says is this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We do all those other things. Of course we do. 
But let's not take our eye off of the main thing. It's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Wow, love seems to be pretty important. It's the fulfillment of all the commandments, Jesus tells us. May we be a people of love who keep on loving each other especially. Sometimes when it comes, well, let me say this. We keep on loving each other. And one of the ways that that plays out is in our possessions and how we handle our goods, our finances. Is it the only way? Of course not. Look at the end of Luke, uh, uh, Acts chapter 2. Luke tells us about how the early church is breaking bread with each other, about how they're hanging out in the home and in their temple, spending time with each other. They're hearing the apostles preach the word of God. After all of that is important too. But this text specifically, Luke drills down on this point of giving to each other financially. So here, here's an illustration that I thought of. I don't know if this is going to fly, but let's try it. Sometimes I think that when we deal with our finances, that it looks a little bit like this. That we have you know, uh, the, the pool of resources, right? Maybe this is our income, our salary, or whatnot. And, and then we have these different glasses in life, these different buckets, if you will, that we need to fill up. So say one is our bills that we need to, to pay. And uh, the next one, oh, uh, our savings. You want to make sure we, we put some there? Uh, let's see. Oh, the skis were getting a little dinged up, so we need, we need to have some, some uh, resources for extracurricular, for our fun, for our vacations, for, for whatever you like to do, right? And, of course, as Christians, we know that one of those is our tithes, what we give, give to God. And, oh, we got a little bit left over. Maybe we'll put, put a little bit more and make a double payment on our mortgage so we can pay that thing down faster, right? And there we go. That's how we distribute our, our income, our wealth. But maybe we need to think a little differently about how we give. And we'll do so by thinking about... God gives to us. Yeah, we have our needs. Does God the Father know that we have needs that need to be taken care of? Jesus tells us, of course. And does he give to us as we need? Yes. I think so. Abundantly. <laughs> Whew. And when God sees our needs, he says, here you go. Let me, let me help you out. Fill, fill your needs. Oh, you need some more resources? Oh, you need forgiveness of sins? You need something? I'm not just going to give you stuff. I'm going to give you myself. That's the incarnation. Jesus steps down from the throne of God and he gives us of himself. He, oh, your feet are dirty? Let me throw a towel around my waist so, and I'll wash them off for you. I, I can give you that, right? Oh, that's, you know what? The carpet will dry. We're fine. The, uh, the realities are that Jesus gives us everything we need. Life? You need life? You need righteousness? You need forgiveness? Well, 
and and for what it's worth, there's no leaks in uh, in, in God's giving to us. There's there are no holes. God just keeps pouring His abundant grace. He we we need forgiveness. He gives us the cross. We need a new body. We need healing. He gives us the resurrection. We we need life everlasting. Jesus says, I'm coming back, and and I'm going to bring you with me. And you're going to be with me forever. See, when we have that perspective, what God gives to us abundantly, graciously, continually, now when we see a brother in need, because they, they can't pay a bill? Is it that hard for us to say, all right, here, take a little bit? Because I know God's going to keep giving to me. I think, I think that is a, a helpful worldview for us as Christians to have. Not a, not a scarcity mentality that there are limited resources, but an abundant, abundance mentality that God's going to keep providing everything that we need. And Jesus does. Amen? Amen. I mean, we see this, this is Old Testament, right? But Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 it says this, bring, bring the full tithe into the that there may be food in my house. Who needed the food? Did, was God hungry? Who needed the food? The priest. The, the, the church workers needed some provision, needed some care. And thereby, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. We think oftentimes in a limited, closed system way of thinking. And God says, no, um, I'm going to step into your system and pour down everything that you need in life. And part of the way that that generosity from God plays out in our lives is in our generosity to one another. I've been here for about three years now. And one thing that has become pretty abundantly clear living in Summit County is that uh, there is a, a clear distinction, clear line between, uh, if you will, the haves and the have-nots. I've heard it said this way, I've said this before, uh, that people in Summit County either have two homes or have to work two jobs. And it's oftentimes true. Within our congregation, I also know enough, some things that maybe you don't know, and I'm not saying that we should know all each other's business financially or whatnot, but I know that there are those of you who fall into that two home, three home, four home category, and there are some of you that fall into that two job, three job, four job, I don't really know when I can sleep category. And so what we at, as a church council have done in these past few weeks is we have set up a restricted fund, a designated fund. What that means is it's not part of the, the budget directly for the church, but it's funded by gifts from individuals. And the name of that fund is the Barnabas Fund. That fund is specifically set aside for us to take care of each other. That fund is a, uh, is a uh, place where people who have means, I've, I've had this conversation, people come to me and say, Pastor, I would love to give generously. I just don't know exactly where, where can I put my money in a responsible manner and, and be faithful with it. I want to be a good steward. How can that help? Well, here, here's a place that that can happen. 
Uh, the, the Barnabas Fund is a fund that's funded by members, and it's for members and associate members of, of our congregation that want to, if they have a need, if a medical bill pops up, if the tranny drops on their, their car, if their landlord says, I'm selling the property, sorry, you got uh, two weeks to get out, <laughs> good luck, and they, you need a little help to get through. The Barnabas Fund has been created for those purposes so that we can care for each other. Past myself as pastor, the Board of Elders, we, we oversee that fund, make sure that it's responsibly distributed as needed, also maintaining confidentiality, and that's something we take very seriously. Currently, in the Barnabas Fund, there's $10,000. That fund is set aside specifically so that when you have a need, you can look to your church. Because one of the ways that, that God continues to pour out his blessings on his people in this world it's through his church, through the body of Christ, through the, the, the bride of Christ, the, those who, who uh, uh, um, gather together to hear the, the preaching of the word, to, to, to gather together to receive the sacraments, and who gather together in such a way that when we see someone having a need, we say, we'll take care of you. You're part of our family now. God has been generous to us. May we give a glimpse of that generosity to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So there's more that can be shared about that. Maybe you'll have some questions. That's for, and ask away. I, I love to uh, field those questions. In fact, yeah, it's only 1031 right now. What are your thoughts from the text? From uh, any questions, uh, any pushback that you all have in regards to uh, the sermon today? Yeah, Brent. Yeah. Is it, is it common? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't want to, I, I'd say what's common is that a church really looks at its budget and we kind of put our budget in the same categories as the cups with the, just the pitcher. Like, oh, we, we, got, we can give the pastor a little bit of a raise, but we, we also need to pay for the roof and we need to pay for the heating bills and, you know, that sort of stuff. And so I, I, as I dug around a little bit, I didn't see a whole lot of this in other churches. One place I did see this, I spoke with Kevin Grine from Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and he said that company has a fund like this for their employees. And so that, that was something that was helpful to me. I'd also say this, that because of our congregation, we can manage a fund like this in a much easier way than maybe a congregation of 2,000 people, right? It, it, it's a little different, so we, we need to take that into account. But um, So whether or not it's a common thing in congregations today, I don't know for sure. Uh, I just look at the Bible and see, well, it happened there. It's got to happen here, right? <laughs> like, so, Same gospel there, same gospel here. So, Any other uh, thoughts, Linda? Yeah, so, yeah, how does one access the fund? Um, come talk to me. Come talk to one of the elders. And we say just, uh, you know, give us a, give us a brief write-up on, on kind of what your needs are at this point. Maybe there's more. Maybe there is a, a gambling problem behind this. And, that the, yeah, maybe there are some financial needs, but also there's, there's some counseling needs that, that need to happen too. So, 
that's where we, we want to be able to help holistically in this. Um, yeah, and, and it's not uh, because, um, well, I'll, I'll just say this, yeah, uh, I, I think that's the, the gateway to the, the fund right now because I feel like uh, as pastor, I, I get an insider's look into a lot of people's lives that um, maybe you wouldn't be, other people, or people wouldn't be comfortable sharing with others. So does, does that make sense? Yeah, Patricia. Yeah. Write a check to Christ Lutheran Church, put it in the memo, Barnabas Fund. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, or, you know, no, that's, and that's a good, qu good question. Something, and, and someone needs to remind me to do this this week, with our online giving, we have some drop-down uh, categories. You can designate a gift to the Seeking the Summit campaign. You can designate a gift to the General Fund or, or elsewhere. Um, maybe we'll just put another, put uh, Barnabas Fund right there. So if you want to give online, you don't even have to deal with me. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Rich. Oh, and there's a note. So, yeah, so right now, that's a good placeholder, at least for right now. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Rich. Any other thoughts, questions? Dan? We've got a whole policy written out, and uh, the council took some time to make sure that we thought through this diligently. We don't want to be uh, flippant in handing out this money. And yet, uh, yes, it is a case by case though. Like we left enough wiggle room so that the, my, myself and the Board of Elders can have some uh, discretion regarding how to, how. yeah, and we'll, we'll report that generally to the congregation, uh, you know, the general numbers and stuff without sharing specific names or details of life circumstances, yeah. Yeah, so yes, uh, of course, you know, if the, if the fund just sits there for five years and no one's touching it, maybe we need to reevaluate, all right, maybe this isn't the best way to uh, be using our, our funds, right? So, yeah, good, good question. And, you know, and I'll just say one more thing to this. We elect elders. Each, uh, each elder is individually elected. Um, vote wisely. Right, put the right people in in positions to to make these decisions. Uh, your voting, your vote is a vote of trust, right? So, any other thoughts? I'm starting it today, right? Uh, so yeah, and and uh, yes, and then through congregational meetings, we'll we'll try to keep an update on this. And yes, uh, word of mouth, and you all know, and you know, if you personally have needs, but also, hey, uh, if you find out that someone maybe becomes a member of Christ Lutheran Church in three years, and, and then they fall into hard times financially, you know, oh, <laughs> we have this. Yeah, talk to pastor about that, so. God's been gracious to us, generous to us, so much more than we could ever deserve. And he keeps doing that for us. May we uh, reflect that graciousness to each other. And then next week, we'll talk a little bit about how we do so outside of our own congregation. So, Now may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.